flared accents around it to kind of envelop the uh, the wheels and everything else. So it kind of bulge at certain points in the car, but otherwise be quite petite. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Car Nerd Talks where today I'm going to be talking to you about something very interesting which is the 1962 Studebaker Avanti. Now if you haven't heard of the Studebaker it's an interesting car uh, manufacturer that ended uh, only a year and a half later in 1963 and the Avanti was their last ever production car and it's pretty incredible at that. So before I jump into that, welcome to the Car Nerd Talks. I'm Jason Hassett, the Car Nerd, and just a bit of housekeeping. We're going to be doing a podcast every Saturday from now on. Uh, I'm not sure of the time it'll be released yet, but it's going to be guest interviews from motoring journalists, uh, mainly from DriveTribe.com. So if you're really into just hearing people rant about different aspects of the car world, then definitely tune in for that. So without further ado, let's jump in to the Avanti. The Avanti was the first of the Coke bottle designed cars and if you haven't heard of Coke bottle designed cars you've definitely seen them. For example the uh, original Ford Mustang was Coke bottle design and the Corvette as well uh, in later years was Coke bottle design but the uh, Studebaker Avanti was the first to do this but I want to jump in first to a bit of a background about Studebaker in case you haven't heard of them. They were a massive massive force in the car industry in America up until uh, the 50s. Unfortunately for them in the 60s they ran into financial problems and left but it was started in 1852 by the Studebaker brothers. There was five of them and basically they were making uh, carriages for horses to draw along. Horse drawn carriages I believe they call them. And in 1972 due to a massive expansion they actually owned the biggest plant in the world for making these. So at one point they were technically the largest carriage company in the world. Now in the late 1890s one of the Studebaker brothers who was in charge died and his son-in-law took over the company and he knew the importance of the horseless uh, carriage or automobile or car as we know them today and he wanted to push forward on that. Now at the time another interesting fact about the history of cars electric cars were actually more popular and the reason for this is people were driving short distances around town so in New York in the early 1900s it was mainly electric cars but then the Americans started and in Europe as well started connecting up towns and they connected up highways along between different cities and people couldn't have that sort of range for example the Bursey electric taxi which I spoke about on Drive Tribe recently this week had a range of 35 miles which was barely enough to drive around London for the day let alone to allow you to go from New York to Philadelphia so a horse would have been better. In 1902 Studebaker produced their first electric car in their South Bend Indiana plant which as I said before was the largest in the world for horse drawn carriages. And then in 1904 it became clear that they needed to get in on the gasoline action which they did in a massive way. And by 1912 they were all in on gasoline cars and had stopped producing electric cars altogether. Over the course of the next 50 years Studebaker had a mixture of success. Um, some very successful cars and others not so much and unfortunately then during the war they had to use the plant for other things and they never really recovered after that. They had 20 years of production of gasoline cars after the war as well running up to 1962 and they had gotten so big by that point that they opened another plant in Ontario, Canada to produce cars for export globally. Unfortunately, this didn't work out quite well for Studebaker. And in 1962, with the release of the Avanti, this would be the last ever production car they made. And in December 1963, they closed down the two plants altogether. So there was no more South Bend, Indiana plant for Studebaker to produce their cars. So in 19, the early 1960s, Studebaker hired a guy called Robert Lowry to design their cars. Now Lowry had been a prolific designer who had come uh, into different things and one of his most famous inventions was the contoured coke bottle. Um, you probably know of this, the glass coke bottle that kind of is shaped almost woman-like I guess you would say. He also designed a lot of different things but never really cars and they decided to give him the job because of his stature in the design world and they thought he'd come up with something cool. And he did, he employed his coke bottle design in the Studebaker Avanti. Now if you look at the Avanti and as you can see it on screen now, basically what this means is the car had a minimal shape in terms of 
uh, the structure of it. So it was a minimal car uh, size wise, but had flared arches and a lot of flared accents around it to kind of envelop the, uh, the wheels and everything else. So it kind of bulge at certain points in the car, but otherwise be quite petite. And that's what he wanted. He wanted a two plus two sports coupe. Um, and that's where the Avanti came from. Robert Lowry just put a team together within Studebaker and started working on the Avanti. He decided they were gonna do this very, very quickly and because of the financial issues that Studebaker was having at the time, this was of grave importance. So the 40 day team that he put together designed this entire car in, well, 40 days. So the car itself was a low slung two plus two coupe, as I mentioned but he wanted the body to be as light as possible. And also some of the curves and different design features would have been very, very difficult at the time to develop in, fi or in steel. So he decided it would be best if they build it in fiberglass. This was done once or twice before in the previous 10 years and most famously on the 1953 Chevrolet Corvette. So they decided to go to the same company that produced the Chevrolet Corvette uh, body and built it fiberglass. Uh, with them. They took the chassis from a Studebaker Lark and mounted the design on that. So it now had a Studebaker Lark chassis with a brand new fiberglass monocoque. And then they added a V8 from the uh, Studebaker Skylark to give it its power. The final product which came to light in 1962 and was unveiled at two car shows in April was incredible. This thing had a very futuristic design and a massive engine to beat. One of its main features was the grillless nose where the air was sucked in underneath. This wouldn't become popular until the 80s and it looked very futuristic. Uh, and I think they called it wasp wasted design. Um, and it looked just incredible. It kind of meanly kind of sank down on the ground, but then had two weirdly nice looking lights. All this together, the fiberglass, the massive V8 engine that they had taken from the Skyhawk gave this thing incredible power and speed. Baker was hoping that this car would save them from their financial distress. Unfortunately, this wasn't the case. And even though they wanted to produce 4,000 at minimum a year, only 1,200 were made in 1962. And they did ramp up to 4,000 in 1963, but it didn't save the company. And unfortunately, that was all that was made. The engine in this car was a 4.7 liter V8, which had been tweaked from the Skyhawk to give 240 horsepower, which gave it a huge, huge power to weight advantage over a lot of its rivals. They then fitted it with a three speed automatic, or if you prefer, and if you're more intelligent, you could also get a four speed manual. This car went on to break 29 speed records at the Bonneville Salt Flats. That's how incredibly fast this car was for its era. And when it was released, it was the fastest production car ever made. As I said, this was a very high performance car for its time. And because it was the fastest production car of all time, you're probably wondering what its top speed was. 178 miles an hour, which for 1962 was incredible. And not only would it get to that high speed, it would also do not to 60 in eight seconds, which doesn't sound like a lot now, but this was 1962. And it would go on to 100 miles an hour in just 12 seconds. Remember I said you want that manual? Well, this is why. Imagine driving that across the Bonneville Salt Flats with a four-speed manual. How cool would that be? Like I said, unfortunately, it didn't save Studebaker and the company closed all of its doors in December 1963 after produ producing only 5,200 of the Avanti. And history is history, so we don't have them around anymore. But I thought this was a really cool car that I wanted to talk about, so here we are. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And don't forget on Saturday to watch the podcast edition. Also, the podcast will be on Spotify, Stitcher, and all the different places that you can listen to it. So if you search now on Spotify for the Carnard Talks, you'll be able to subscribe so you can see when it's released. Thank you again for watching. Talk to you tomorrow.